We have a tremendous sense of community in Buffalo that you don't get in other places. Well, I think a lot of things over time have disappeared. I think it's important to preserve a little bit of history as you progress into the future. You have a lot of great architecture and structures around the city of Buffalo, but Central Terminal affected everybody. There's something about the old auditorium that was unique. It was um, a different feel altogether. Sattler's was this fabulous emporium on Broadway. It was huge. It was four floors, and um, every floor was delightful. So I would say Christmas was the best thing. Everything was totally decorated. It was just mystical, a very happy time. So there's just a fondness for the uh, uh, good old days. You know, people like nostalgia, and Buffalo people like nostalgia. You never forget your history, and you, you always remember the good years. Remembering Western New York is made possible by the members of WNED-TV. Thank you. What you're seeing back then, which is a bit different than what you're seeing uh, today, is the image of men, women, children, walking up and down the street, clutching bags of stuff, you know, beribbon boxes and whatnot. The image that we have, Christmas carols, city sidewalks, busy sidewalks, they're dressed in holiday style. All the lampposts on Main Street festooned with Christmas trees, lights. There was a time when Buffalo's Main Street was the focus of holiday shopping in Western New York. It was busy. It was beautiful busy because then it was just booming with people and excitement and everybody was sharing what they were going to be doing for the holidays. Oh, lots of people, lots of people. It was mostly all the families there and it was special to be with family and with your parents. So I would say Christmas was the best thing. The music, the atmosphere, the, the scent of cinnamon in the air, all of that. <laughs> You know, so you knew when you went, you were there for hours, and that was always very important. You didn't have to go home too soon, <laughs> you know. Before the suburban malls of today, Western New York Christmas shoppers found what they needed at large department stores. It was really this wonderful, glorious machine. People would come in and be happy to spend the money. You could very often find the perfect gift for nine different people say, on your list. There was something literally for everyone there. For many, the joy of the season started even before entering the store. Christmas windows, every department store had them. The poles outside the store with Christmas lights, Christmas decorations, wreaths. Street light was decorated, even the wiring across to connecting, and wreaths and large bells. And you had the um, Salvation Army with the bells. The energy was just phenomenal. They would decorate uh, right, right before Thanksgiving, so you'd have like a whole window of opportunity to go like 30 days or more. Everything was totally decorated. It could be for blocks at a time. Mm -hmm. It was decorated beautifully. I mean, we just decorated to the hilt, and, and everybody had the spirit. There was not a lack of spirit. You're smelling peppermint, you're smelling pine essence, uh, stuff like that. If the lights could be brighter, they were brighter. And of course, Christmas music playing all the time. A lot of hubbub. The crowds would be that much thicker. And it, what's interesting, they're in a better mood. <laughs> it was just mystical, a very happy time. You know, and as a child, I was like, yes, I was coming to town, and the tunes are playing, and we're like excited. Christmas Eve, I pretty much stayed up a lot with my mom at night and make sure all the toys were set up. But it was very joyous and just very tender to the heart. My mom really enjoyed it. That was She was a child at heart. 
So if you're shopping on Main Street, you're packed with people, kids are off of school, you're seeing your friends, everyone's in a good mood, and the atmospherics are there. It's, it's literally snowing, or you can see your breath, you have hot chocolate. You're cold on the outside, you're warm on the inside. That's hard to beat. Well, Sattler's was kind of this fabulous emporium on Broadway. And it was one of these stores that started small until it grew into the single largest department store in Buffalo. It was huge. It was four floors, and um, every floor was delightful. Oh, goodness. Sattler's was the biggest store in Buffalo, New York. As a child, that's what I remember and it was a, a place of celebration for us and memories. Sattler's opened in 1889 as a one-room shoe store at 998 Broadway. At its peak in the 1950s, the flagship store covered six acres. The department stores that we had in Buffalo, Sattler's on Broadway, these were three and four times the size of a typical department store today. These stores were like 300,000 square feet, 400,000 square feet. You could get a parakeet, you could get a ham, you could get sponge candy, you name it. It was shoes and all kind of clothing, all the best toys ever. They had the best toy department. Then subsequently as it expanded, there was a supermarket in there. And that was like the best thing ever because you could shop clothing but the, and then go for food. Anything. <laughs> I think that's where I started my, my shoe alcoholism. <laughs> I, the shoes were fantastic. The clothes were fantastic. Uh, jewelry was, was amazing. My mother would uh, uh, buy her jewelry. She'd put it on layaway, and she'd pay a dollar a week if that's what it took. It, it was uh, just varied. You could get everything and anything there. It reminded me of a decorated warehouse, and everything was just big and neat and orderly. Everybody was always very friendly, and I would go with my mom and, and siblings, of course, so it was just a place of like exploration and just wanting to be there and not leave. <laughs> we don't want to go home. <laughs> the impact of Sattler's went beyond what people could buy. It grew into a centerpiece not only of retail in Buffalo, but the social life of the entire east side. My mother was an immigrant from Poland, and so when she came here, her English was not great. And when she went shopping at Sattler's, she could talk Polish. For a lot of people, immigrants coming from uh, Europe and whatnot, it must have been one of these miraculous uh, things that kind of reflected uh, at least their dreams of what uh, you could get in America. Sattler's closed in 1982, replaced by, of all things, a big box discount store. The landmark building on Broadway was torn down in 1989. But the fondness remains for what Sattler's represented in Western New York. Because it's in the community, it made you feel a little more connected that people actually cared. It was just having a place to call our own. That's pretty much what it was and the entire experience of walking into this uh, space and uh, getting this sensory bombardment, I think that's what people recall. And it's actually pleasant to experience that, just the, the, the wonderful experience of shopping in such a situation. It still brings tears to my eyes <laughs> because it was a good place. It really was. The experience was being with family. Sattler's means life and memories from the heart. Simon Pure Beer is a very good beer, is a very good beer, is a very good beer. Look far or near, no better beer than Simon Pure Beer for drinking. Buffalo's a beer town. It's always been a beer town. The first wave of immigrants into Buffalo were Germans, and they built breweries all over Buffalo. 
It's really one of the building blocks of our city were these great breweries like Simon Pure. Since 1811, there was over 200 documented small breweries. Most of them in the 1800s were uh, a brewer would only handle small areas in a two or three blocks around his brewery. The Simon family started in the beer business in Buffalo in 1888 and opened the William Simon Brewery in 1900. Four generations of Simons have been involved with the brewery, including Bill Simon's father. And he operated the brewery until 1972 when it closed, and it was the last of the Buffalo breweries. And I believe there was six or seven of them that um, came back after Prohibition. And they all eventually dropped off, you know, went out of business. And he was the last brewery to go out of business. I would say it's part of the history of being a blue collar working class. You came out of the plants and the factories dusty and tired. You needed something to wash down the throat. You know, get a little dust out of the way. Buffalo was a very active city. Milling, steel mills, flour mills, shipping. It was a hubbub of activity here in Buffalo. And that's why the breweries actually became so big and popular because these workers uh, were in very dusty, dirty jobs and uh, after work and during work, even during the work day, they would go to their taverns and have a beer or two. And on the way home, they would have a beer or two. You know, they were part of everyday life. The beer company sponsored a lot of the sports leagues in the area, there was the beer leagues for the softball and the hardball. They had bowling teams that were in the classic league that would win the league year after year. And if you could beat a Simon Pure team, you were good. All of those things helped to make Buffalo what it was. Western New York is experiencing a growing craft beer movement. Simon Pure, Iroquois, and a handful of other breweries represent the region's beer-making heritage. Breweries were big in Buffalo. There's a brewery that, you know, produced the beer back then that your dad and your grandfather were drinking. I think it's just the fact people want to remember and look at and be able to see it. And hopefully pass some of that knowledge on to the young people coming up today and say, you know, here's part of our history of the city from day one up to present. So make good, satisfying Simon Pure Beer, your beer for drinking. The play-by-play -play broadcaster for the Buffalo Sabres, Ted Darling. My name is Ted Darling, and from one darling to all of you darlings. When we talk about an institution, Memorial Auditorium was an institution. This place was, a, was fabulous. There's something about the old auditorium. That was our building. It was small, and you better be ready to play if you're gonna beat us in that building. Buffalo Memorial Auditorium opened in 1940. Over its 50-year history, it was home to special events and sports teams. What it lacked in comparison to modern sports facilities, it made up for in its personal connection with players and fans. The odd is sort of like taking somebody home to your um, modest home. You know, it's not much, but come on, welcome. That's really the, the feeling that the odd had for us. Good morning, boys and girls and parents, and welcome the Buffalo Sabres first open practice to skate out on the ice for warm-ups. You would see people in the stands, and like, after a couple of years, they kind of became your friends. It was a close little uh, feeling, and it was a small, compact arena. And I think the crowd had the same sense with us, and it became very personal after a while. And uh, the fact that you could walk up to almost anybody in Western New York of a certain age, and they'll have something to say about it. They'll have a memory to share. Mr. Nixon coming down the center aisle through this mass here at Memorial Auditorium. 
historic first clinic and memorial auditorium for professional basketball. We're very proud of the building. I think it's uh, comparable to any building in the country. My favorite memory at the yard, the most celebratory memory, was 1972-73. The Sabres made the playoffs for the first time and unfortunately uh, drew Montreal in the first round. So game six held in Buffalo on a Sunday night and they, they lost. But with about, I'd say, seven or eight minutes left, the fans in unison started chanting, thank you, Sabres. Thank you, Sabres. And it was just a superb feeling of community. And it was just a heck of a ride that season. A team that you really fell in love with. The Odd was expanded and renovated several times over the years. But as it aged and even began to wear out, it never lost its nostalgic appeal. I think we wear it as kind of a, a badge of honor here in Buffalo and in Western New York that we've got this hockey arena. It's kind of a dump, but we love it. It's our dump. It sort of speaks to our blue collar ethic that, that these places were, uh, were what they were to us. I can still smell the place. And it's not necessarily bad. I mean, it's kind of a dank, uh, uh, musty type of smell. But it didn't matter because all the buildings in the NHL were like that. We have a tremendous sense of community in Buffalo that you don't get in other places. And when you have that common rooting interest, the Buffalo Bills, the Buffalo Sabres, the Buffalo Braves, the Buffalo Bisons, it's a tremendous sense of community that you really don't get in other cities. We do live through our sports teams. The Odd closed in 1996. Buffalo sports teams moved to the new Marine Midland Arena, now First Niagara Center. A dozen years later, the building was demolished. I couldn't watch them take the place down, so I didn't even want to see any of it come down. It's just uh, too many memories. You can see where those memories are so ingrained into the guys that were there. It was family, it was home. It's something that everybody reveres, everybody loves. Um, maybe everybody appreciates the warts, you know, when we're talking about some of these places, they aren't the greatest, but they're ours. People love talking about it. They love talking about the auditorium. It'll never be forgotten. It was unique. It was um, a different feel altogether. It felt like Buffalo. People have a real interest in carousels. And people will say, oh, I haven't heard music like that in years. I haven't ridden the carousel in years. Brings back great memories. It's so fast. <laughs> it's so fast. You don't realize how fast it is. And I think when you're littler, everything is, is exaggerated. The Herschel Carousel Factory Museum in North Tonawanda celebrates Western New York's contribution to the golden age of carousels in America. In the early 1900s, Herschel was one of a handful of factories making hand-carved wooden carousels. Today, the museum allows people to relive the experience of riding an original Herschel carousel. When I first rode it, I couldn't have been more than four. Beverly O'Neill grew up near Toronto during the Depression. On Sundays, her family would travel to Burlington Beach on Lake Ontario to swim and enjoy the amusement park. And when we got through with swimming, we would go across the street to a little amusement park. And this was the carousel at that amusement park. 
When I came here and discovered it was my childhood carousel, I was just blown away. It was just so thrilling. I watch other grandparents with their grandchildren and people with their kids, and it, it just reminds me of how much fun it was to be with my dad and enjoy that. Built in 1916, the historic carousel has 36 hand-carved horses and more than 580 lights. It is one of only 71 carousels still in existence in the United States and Canada that were manufactured in North Tonawanda. I feel lucky to live here and to be this close to it and to be involved with the museum. Like my mom, me, Miranda, we all ride it together. And you bring back old memories and, and just creating new ones for, for her, my daughter. She'll remember riding with grandma and mommy on, on these rides, just like I remember riding with my mom. Last year, we actually had eight of my great-grandchildren on the ride. We had eight little ones, ranging from one that was only two months old. Six generations, if you count my grandmother. I think it's a really important part of the Tonawanda's past. There's a connection because of the carving. We try to keep up the tradition of carving and how carving was done. And it's preserving these wonderful machines that are really the premier American folk art figures. I'm using the tools and techniques that they would have used in the factory. I carve these to show the people that things really haven't changed. The senior citizens that come in, it reminds them of their youth and immediately a smile comes to their face. And then the youngsters, the very small ones, are a little leery at first, uh, but after a ride or two, it's just the opposite. I just love to see the smiling faces. I remember being in that love tub back when it was pink and black and before it was restored. I remember being in the tub with my brother, spinning the wheel and laughing and, you know, being like, you kind of get stuck together with the force of it. That's like one of my best memories as a kid. I know my grandchildren have great memories. My daughter has great memories and I'm hoping that the little ones will have great memories too. Well, I think a lot of things over time have disappeared and you can't get that back. I think it's important to preserve a little bit of history as you progress into the future. So I just want that to go on for more generations. It's fun. I, I love to look at the people's faces. It's nice to see them enjoying it. And the little kids, it's amazing. It's just wonderful to see people feeling so happy. find more camaraderie here than any place I've ever been. Well, it, it was a place of happiness. At those days, we didn't call it the club, we called it the local. And you could come here, you could hear good music. Buffalo's Colored Musicians Club started as a meeting place for Union Local 533, which represented African American musicians in the city. It was a place of its time, and a place ahead of its time. We had the two separate unions, but most of the jazz went on right here. It was integration was going on here before it was, you know, before it was fashionable, so to speak. The musicians didn't seem to have any color problems. And at the time, there was a separation of the unions, the white union versus the black union. In the early years, they never belonged to the same union, but they were on the same stage together, and the thought was that as long as you're unionized, we don't care what color you are, we play, and, and that's what happened. The Black Musicians Union was formed in 1917. A year later, some union members formed a social club as a place for musicians to hang out after hours. The Colored Musicians Club later became a separate entity and moved into the current building 
in 1934. The music was super exciting because you'd have some of the best talent in Buffalo and whoever else was in town would come up here to play. Everybody would come here to play. Everybody came around just to see who might show up musically. You know, uh, they might get a glimpse to see Lena Horne, uh, they may might uh, see Dizzy or Miles Davis, uh, you know, Charlie Parker. The Sunday jam sessions at the club were a place where local musicians might get their big break. On Sunday afternoons, they'd have what they call cutting sessions. That's where each musician tried to cut the throat of the other one, you know. Let me outdo you and I'll outdo better than you, you know. And it was wonderful. It was a great learning ground. And that's how probably a lot of the local guys got to then go on the road with these famous acts because they heard them up here jamming. As it approaches its 100th anniversary, the Colored Musicians Club remains an important part of Buffalo's cultural history. It would have been really special. It was just guys just letting go with other, you know, hot musicians. They were just feeding off each other. When you came here and you came in this room, this very same room, you forgot you had no troubles. Everything was forgotten and it was a, a place of enjoyment. I used to go in that corner right back there and buy one bottle of beer and nurse it for an hour or so, you know, but I enjoyed the music and, and the, the, the friendship that was up here. The club kept me here. If this club wasn't here, I know I wouldn't be in Buffalo still. I would have been somewhere else. So I would say it, it was that important that it, it held a lot of musicians here. With the museum downstairs now, we get a whole different outlook on what the jazz history was in the city of Buffalo and what the relationship with the club is to music in general. And of course, things are happening now at the club again. You never forget your history. And, and you, you always remember the good years. And that's what you remember. You remember the good times and the good things. It is the club. And it means just that. A club means when people come together and of the same, same philosophy and they come and they mingle and they strive and they enjoy each other's company. And that's what this is, a place to come because it is, as it says, the club. Buffalo's a small, small city. We have so much going for us now, whether it's canal side, uh, our architecture, but the Bills and the Sabres, they're also very, very important to the collective psyche of the region. The places where those sports teams played are part of the collective memory of Western New York. I, I don't know where the origin of the term, but it certainly came kind of affectionately as, boy, there's a big, massive, concrete thing over there, and uh, it's like a rock pile. The stadium opened in 1937 as a Depression-era construction project. In 1960, it became home to the Buffalo Bills of the new American Football League and was renamed War Memorial Stadium. It certainly didn't look like a modern stadium. When you walked into it, you just saw, you know, a big mass of uh, concrete and seats, uh, you know, nothing plush, no lounges, no real box seats. The end zone seats were like one or two dollars. <laughs> when we were introduced and came on the field, we actually went through those seats uh, in the end zone. So, you know, people felt very close to the uh, ball players. It was very uh, intimidating, menacing maybe to some individuals. So there's some kind of intimacy between the fans and the uh, ball players. You don't see a stadium like that today. They're all palaces. Uh, War Memorial was far from a palace, but it's special because uh, of the, the boyhood memories that I have at that place. Football wasn't the only sport played at the rock pile. It was also home to the Buffalo Bisons. It was a big deal back then, opening day. 
My grandfather he was an avid baseball fan, uh, loved baseball. So he got a couple of tickets for the home opener in 1967. We took a cab to War Memorial, and it was a beautiful day. I still remember it being very sunny. I think we played the Richmond Braves. I will always uh, remember those times. It was an era that uh, you won't forget as, because it happened during your childhood. The Rock Pile was also the setting for one of the most beloved baseball movies of all time. 1983 was the season of the recording of The Natural. And what's funny about The Natural is I've got so many friends in the movie. I mean, the, you know, it was buys and employees that were in the movie. The film featured stars like Robert Redford and Glenn Close, but for many, it was the setting that stole the show. I'd like to say that the star of The Natural is War Memorial Stadium, and the producers were so fortunate that they were able to find this place because it really was a perfect stadium uh, for uh, that kind of story. And one of the other reasons I watch The Natural is I love the old ballpark. It's my chance to revisit the old ballpark. For its day and age, at least when it was constructed, it was a big time stadium. It was a significant structure on the Niagara frontier. So there's just a fondness for the uh, uh, good old days. You know, people like nostalgia and Buffalo people like nostalgia. So I think that's part and parcel of why, why people sometimes uh, fondly look back at the uh, old rock pile. We're hard working people. We're a shot and a beer team. We weren't fancy. And that, that represented, I think, the uh, spirit of Buffalo. People in Buffalo are good, hardworking, conservative individuals, and uh, that's what we try to represent for the uh, city of Buffalo. It, it just uh, had that, that charm, uh, an old stadium, the old rock pile. It just reminds me of uh, the good old days, of being there with my father, watching uh, uh, football and baseball, my grandfather taking me to a Bison's game. I'll share with my grandkids, you know, the memories of going to War Memorial and the memories of that era. And I will show them pictures and, and uh, make sure that the tradition continues of remembering War Memorial, those special times for generations to come. Awesome. I would look at it and wonder how they ever built stuff like this. How would they ever accomplish something like this? You have a lot of great architecture and structures around the city of Buffalo, but Central Terminal affected everybody. Everybody from the common man to the movie star walked this concourse. Buffalo's Central Terminal opened in 1929 at a time when hundreds of trains passed through the city every day. It speaks of the heyday of Buffalo, when Buffalo was the sixth, seventh largest city in the country, and the Central Terminal was part of it. With throngs of people, you couldn't see from end to end of the concourse. And there was a saying, meet me at the Buffalo, or Statuesque Buffalo that was at the end of the concourse. It was a meeting place. There were so many people, you couldn't find anybody. So the meet me at the Buffalo phrase was extremely key to finding your loved ones. Gary Dunham worked for the railroad for 44 years. Central Terminal is where he proposed to his wife. I uh, worked up my nerve, I was nervous. And I asked her to marry me here and she said, okay. Right there in front of the coffee shop by the Buffalo. Cutest girl I ever did see still is. So it's special, yeah, very special. The Central Terminal is also where many Western New Yorkers went off to World War II. A lot of soldiers, a lot of veterans have passed through here. Over my shoulder there's a kiosk. That's, it was a watch and jewelry counter. When people called off to war, they wanted to get engaged. They quite frankly got engaged at the kiosk right here at Central Terminal. Myself and another docent were walking by the clock. There was a grandmother and her grandson sitting by the clock, sitting on a bench. 
and she pointed to the train concourse and said, you know, that's the last place I seen your grandfather. It's, it's built of memories. This building affected everyone. It's not just some mansion, some great piece of architecture. There's a lot of history inside this building. After the war, cars became the favored mode of transportation. The station closed in 1979. But the memories created at Buffalo's Central Terminal outlive its time as a train station. I'm first generation American. My parents are immigrants. They uh, re-emigrated back to the Netherlands and I earned my way back. I had gotten used to riding trains in Europe and I said, I want to arrive in Buffalo at this grand train station. It was an experience. Getting off the train, going up the platform, going across the bridge to the uh, main waiting room and uh, seeing the little buffalo, then this great space. You know, welcome to Buffalo. It was amazing. Points of arrival are so important, and you want to give people, citizens, visitors, you want to give them a sense of the possibilities of your city. It's that experience of arrival and the promise of the place where you're disembarking. This is a public place. This is grandeur. This is our terminal. It was a community place. It was a gathering place. In the 30s and 40s, the Depression, things like that, so people went to the movies to get the latest news and, quite frankly, came to the Central Terminal just, just to watch the world go by. There's something about it. It's a special place. And there aren't many places on Earth that are special places. And this is one of them. Remembering Western New York is made possible by the members of WNED-TV. Thank you.